I had taken these slides out in the interest of time, but after this morning, I put them back in. Some people say cancer is a genetic disease. Some people say it's metabolic. Some people say it's epigenetic. I think in cartoons. To me, this is how I look at it. You can say it's genetic, you can say it's metabolic, you can say it's epigenetic. At the end of the day, it looks like that, okay? You can't separate them. If you want to talk about what causes the cancer, and if you could figure out a way to go back to that very first cell, you might be able to say one of these things. But the bottom line is, by the time cancer is seen and being treated, it looks like that, okay? Everybody who spoke up to now, beautifully, I've really enjoyed this conference, has helped some people. Nobody has cured everybody. Because cancer looks like that and it keeps changing. So I'm gonna talk about the work we've been doing on using uh, metabolic ketosis with the standard of care. Because if cancer is the perfect storm, and that's how we see it in our lab, the way to hit the perfect storm is with anything you can. So somebody also this morning had made a beautiful comment that um, everything about the, the hallmarks of cancer involves metabolism, and indeed it does. I'm not a biochemist, so I'm not even gonna begin to tell you what all those things are. So the very first experiment we did to see if we were gonna move into this field was we took cells in the culture and we took a very aggressive tumor. It was the fourth tumor that a patient had, very, very aggressive, and we did a growth curve and then we added ketones, and it inhibited their growth somewhat. We added BCNU, or carmistine, which is the therapy this patient got, and it inhibited it, and then they started to grow again. But when we put the two together, it really nailed the cells. And what was really cool about it is we didn't drop the glucose. We just dumped ketones in the media. But that right there was enough for me to say, yeah, maybe I want to start studying this in my lab, and that's what we did. Rightly so, we were told you really can't get a good idea of what's going on in culture in that kind of sense, so we moved into an animal model. And here you can see, just using the ketogenic diet, and in our lab we've been using a product called KetoCal. Uh, it's a human formulation, it's a powder, you mix it with water, the animals eat it, they don't lose weight, they roll in it, they get a little greasy, but they're fine. Uh, we're using that really not because it's the only way to go, but because we want to get this into patients and we thought that a human formulation was pretty good. Uh, so you can see it, it, it extended life. But what was really cool is when we used it with temozolomide, which is the current standard of care chemotherapy in brain tumors, it extended beyond what you would get with temozolomide in the standard diet. But what was really cool was when we added it to radiation. And this was incredibly exciting to us that in fact, nine of 11 of the animals, the tumor completely disappeared. And because our model is bioluminescent, we know the animals had the tumor. And after day 101, because we image them about every three days, we switched them back to standard diet and the tumors didn't come back. Now, does that mean I think we can cure humans? No, it's pretty easy to cure mice. After all, we give the tumor to the mice. It's only fair that we can cure it in the mice. But this was enough when we published it for patients to find this paper and get really excited about it and say, hey, maybe they should try it. And that actually is what led to us having a clinical trial as a patient who saw this in literature, did so well that our clinicians went from, oh, gee, to, yeah, maybe we should try it. Okay, but that's not all. This diet, and, uh, I, I'm gonna stop saying the word diet because that's a four letter word, especially if you wanna get funded. Metabolic ketosis, whether you get it from fasting or the ketogenic diet or caloric restriction, it's got so many effects in glioma. I don't have time to show you the data, it's all published. Uh, it's, this isn't just my data, this is data from myself, from Tom, from Dom D'Agostino, from um, Dr. Longo. Many people have found this now. It reduces growth factor expression. It reduces angiogenesis. It reduces peritumor edema, the swelling around the tumor. And this is all in preclinical models. But if it does this in preclinical models, maybe it'll do it in people. And if it does it in people, maybe we can reduce the use of steroids. Uh, it reduces hypoxia. That's evidenced by a reduction of carbonic anhydrase, which demonstrates hypoxia. But that also leads to a reduction in HIF-1-alpha. HIF-1-alpha is a transcriptional regulator, when that is up, it's bad for the patient. So it reduces that. It reduces migration and metastasis of tumor cells. It reduces the expression of cyclooxygenase 2. That's probably one of the ways it gets its anti-inflammatory activity. It reduces phosphorylated NF-kappa B. That's also something that promotes the growth of tumor cells. So by reducing it, you're helping to reduce the growth of the tumor cells. 
Phospho-AKT, you heard about that this morning. That's another thing that's involved in metabolism and tumor growth. We also found that it enhances the anti-tumor immune response directly. So we found that animals on a ketogenic diet, they have reduced PD-L1, they have reduced CTLA-4, the pharmaceutical companies have drugs that are trying to do this, and it increased the anti-tumor cytokines and it increased tumor cell killing. In other words, this stuff is snake oil. For those of you from the U.S., snake oil is something that in the Old West, they'd say, take this elixir, it'll cure everything. So at first I didn't believe it, but we did it over and over again, and other people have done it too. So altering metabolism has huge effects, as you guys all heard this morning, and probably you all believe. And the other thing that we found in the lab is that it may actually resensitize cells that are resistant to therapy. So when brain tumors are treated, they're treated with standard of care, surgery, radiation, chemo, the, the worst form of the brain tumors, when those tumors come back, they're often resistant to the therapies that have been used. When we take cells in the laboratory that are resistant to therapies and we add ketones, we can actually resensitize them. So that means this might be really good for recurrent tumor, which is really, in brain tumors, a, a disease that there's not much to offer patients. So all the hallmarks are really potential therapeutic targets. So we tried to figure out, okay, exactly how is this working? Well, this is our, these are our mouse cells, the ones that we've used in vivo. And one of the things that was cool is when we used a low dose of radiation, a low dose of ketones, and the ketone beta-hydroxybutyrate, the dose is too low to change growth all by itself. But even at that low dose, it enhanced radiation. Human cells, and these are actually human cells from a recurrent tumor. This is not the patient's initials. It's a random two-letter code. The R means it's a recurrent tumor. Same thing. When you put the two together, they actually potentiate each other. So how do they have such a very potent anti-tumor effect and epigenetic alterations? For those of you who might not know, epigenetics are changes in organisms that are caused by modification of gene expression, not necessarily by alteration of the genetic code. So it's not necessarily a mutation, but it changes in the way the genes are expressed. And in fact, histone acetylation, I'm not going to get into the biochemistry, is uh, one of these, and it was found a few years ago that beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the main ketone in, um, that's made when somebody is on a ketogenic diet or fasting, is actually an inhibitor of histone deacetylases, and I'll kind of get into that in a bit, in a minute. Then there's also, oh, uh, and histone deacetylase inhibitors, or HDAC inhibitors, are being looked at now as therapeutic modalities. They're in clinical trials. Non-coding RNAs, for example, microRNAs, are also altered by the ketogenic diet. MicroRNAs are also being looked at in some clinical trials as uh, therapeutic modalities. And then alterations in DNA methylation, same thing. So what is histone acetylation in cancer? Uh, again, I think in cartoons, so for me a picture is really important. When we look at DNA, DNA doesn't exist as this molecule hanging out. It's wrapped around proteins called histones and it can have modifiers on it, like these little methyl groups, and these are histone acetylase groups. And in this form, the DNA is pretty resistant to therapy. In this form, it's kind of opened up. And you can see, if you were a radiation molecule and you wanted to hit a piece of DNA, it'd be a little hard to find it here, but it's pretty darn easy to find it here. So this is what we want for therapy. This is, this is the good thing if we're going to give a patient therapy for, um, for cancer. And in fact, these two things go back and forth. So histone acetyl transferases, or HATs, take the DNA from that form to that form. HDACs take it from this form to that form. And the ketone beta-hydroxybutyrate inhibits this. So it promotes the DNA to be in a more sensitive form. And what we found is um, that DNA damage, for example, what happens with radiation or with some chemotherapies, is increased by beta-hydroxybutyrate. You don't really have to be a scientist for this. All you have to see is darker is more. So this particular protein is an indication of DNA damage. So with no beta-hydroxybutyrate and no radiation, there's only a little bit of it. With radiation, there's more of it. With radiation plus beta-hydroxybutyrate, there's even more of it. So it statistically significantly increases DNA damage in cancer cells. This is a good thing. Same thing in human cells. Okay, so does this have anything to do with that acetylation stuff I told you about? 
Well, this is a marker of histone acetylation. Again, more is better. So these are levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, this is, would be what a person would have with a low level of ketosis. This is kind of a higher level, and this is honestly outside of the um, physiologic range. But you can see there's more of this histone acetylation stuff. And this is a protein that's very involved in repair of DNA after radiation. So this goes up, this goes down. Again, we really don't want our cancer cells repairing the damage from uh, radiation or chemotherapy. Uh, it wasn't just in our mouse cell line. It's also in our human primary tumor. It's a recurrent tumor from the same patient, and it's in that really, really aggressive cell line that I told you about that came from the fourth tumor that a patient had. This guy actually said, I want to live, give me four surgeries. And this was back in the 80s. Unfortunately, he didn't, but these cells are very aggressive. So you can see that there was a reduction in RAD51, so that would suggest a reduction in, in DNA repair after therapy. What about microRNAs? MicroRNAs are little RNAs that do not make protein. They're really little. Um, and they're involved in silencing genes. So they turn genes off, essentially. Okay. And in collaboration with a really awesome um, scientist at Imperial College, Dr. Nell Syed, she actually took the tumors from our mice and she did an analysis of all the microRNAs that are known. And what she found was that there were a whole bunch, very technical, a whole bunch, that were increased in animals' tumors where the animal was treated with the ketogenic diet. And why is that important? Because when these are increased, and these are the statistically significant ones, when these are increased, the genes that they target are decreased. Okay, let's look at that hallmark again. So here's the hallmark slide again. Here's all the hallmarks. Here's all the microRNAs that are upregulated with the ketogenic diet. And here's the ones that I was able to find in the literature easily are implicated in brain tumors. So every time you see one of these, it is helping to reduce the expression of the genes that cause this. So again, tumors from animals on ketogenic diet Epigenetic changes sensitize to therapy and help reduce growth. Uh, what about in patients? Well, there have been a number of reports out there. There's reports about patient survival and, and patient um, compliance and things like that that Dr. Williams is going to talk about. But in terms of does this make a difference with patients, I just pulled up a couple of quick reviews. This one by um, Rainer Clement and Colin Champ. Corticosteroids compromise survival in glioblastoma partly through elevation of blood glucose. We heard that this morning. Targeting metabolism with a ketogenic diet during the treatment of, of glioblastoma. Diet, and this was actually back in 2014, before we even knew a lot about the, the whole um, epigenetic alterations that occur due to uh, ketosis. Dietary restriction of carbohydrates through a KD reduces serum glucose levels significantly even in conjunction with high-dose steroids, which may affect the response to standard treatment and prognosis. Larger trials to confirm this are warranted. Why did I put that one in? Because when I first started talking to clinicians about this, I'd get a whole bunch of things. The diet is disgusting. This won't work. It can't be done with steroids because steroids raises glucose. The patient that did unbelievably well that got our clinicians to turn around and say, hey, we should try this, was on steroids. Her glucose was down and her ketones were up, and she is still doing incredibly well. Okay, uh, a very, very recent uh, review just came out from Rainier Clement in uh, radi for radi Radiation Biology. Metabolic differences between normal and tumor cells are exploited by ketogenic therapy. The very first paper we published showed differential effects on the expression of genes in normal brain versus tumor. Why is that important? Because if you're going to sensitize the tumor to radiation, you'd better be darn sure you're not sensitizing the normal brain, okay, because the patients wouldn't like that and the clinicians would like it less. The gene expression is different. The changes in gene expression are different. The metabolic shift from glycolysis towards mitochondrial metabolism selectively increases reactive oxygen production and impairs ATP production in tumor cells. This is a little confusing because in that same paper I just mentioned from, from our group, we saw a reduction in ROS from the ketogenic diet, not an increase. Does that mean we're wrong? Not necessarily. Does that mean he's wrong? Not necessarily. But it certainly points to the fact that we've got to study this more and figure out why do 
different people, different groups, different models sometimes get different results. And how can we exploit that for the patients? Differential stress resistance phenomenon is achieved when glucose and growth factors are reduced and ketones are elevated. I think we all heard a lot about that this morning. Reprogramming normal but not tumor cells from proliferation towards maintenance and stress uh, resistance is done. Again, really important. We actually have some preliminary data suggesting that the ketogenic diet in mice might protect against damage from radiation in mice without the tumor, just looking at the normal brain. This is critically important, especially if you're talking about treating children with brain tumors. And then my favorite, the ketone body, beta-hydroxybutyrate, is an endogenous class one histone deacetylase inhibitor, an HDAC inhibitor, um, suggesting a dual role as a radio protector of normal cells and a radio sensitizer of tumor cells. And that goes along with some of the comments that I know Susan Wood has made about how you're getting enhanced quality of life in a lot of ways. And I think one of the ways you might be getting enhanced quality of life is by reducing the side effects possibly due to this global shift in what's going on. Uh, I found this in, a, again, a very recent article, and I thought this was awesome. Caloric restriction or fasting or fasting mimicking diets, for example, the ketogenic diet. What's going on in normal cells is different in tumor cells. It's also affecting the tumor microenvironment, which includes um, inflammation. It includes the immune system. It includes the microbiome and then changes in circulation. And I thought this, to me, this kind of put everything together from this morning in terms of just a few little arrows and words. So I'm um, getting on a soapbox in front of the wrong audience because you guys are already on the soapbox with me. Why should we study nutritional intervention? First thing, it is unlikely that any single therapy will be an effective therapy for cancer due to tumor heterogeneity, and the tumor's ability to change in response to anything we do to it, whether it's metabolic, chemotherapy, radiation, it doesn't matter. Cancer is Darwinism speeded up. It's survival of the fittest. It shuffles its genes like a deck of cards, and that makes it a moving target. Increasing therapeutic efficacy, generally, in, in the days before what we're talking about, involved increasing doses or combining therapies. Generally speaking, these increased side effects. You've not only got length of life, you've got quality of life you've got to worry about. And then when tumors recur, as in brain tumors they typically will, they're often refractory or not responsive to the original therapies used. So the take home message from, from my point of view is nutritional ketosis, no matter how we talk about doing it, is a very pluripotent, I love that word, it means it does lots of things, that has a wide variety of anti-tumor effects. It will affect pretty much anything you can come up with, it will affect. It has been shown to be safe. The epilepsy community has taught that to us. It has been shown to increase the efficacy of standard cancer therapies, as we've all seen. Uh, the mechanism of action suggests it's not only going to potentiate the therapies we know about, but all the therapies that are coming down the pike, all the newer therapies, the immunotherapies, and everything else we haven't even thought of yet. This is likely to make some, if not all of them, work better. And uh, I really think we need to figure out how this works, why it works, and sometimes why it doesn't. With that, these are the people in my laboratory that actually do the work, especially Eric, my master's student, and high school and college kids. Uh, collaborators, I certainly couldn't do it myself. Uh, the supporting people, and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>